listening to Flop Culture, a podcast where we mainly talk about flops, but we also talk bops, hot goss and pop culture at large. I'm Fanula Jones. Happy Thursday. Thank you so much for listening to last week's episode. I am now very much gearing up for the final season of Succession. I was talking about all your theories on the Instagram, flapculture underscore pod, as to how the season is going to end. And I've been enjoying all the memes and all the videos from the uh, premiere party. If you haven't seen that, please go seek them out. Much needed serotonin. Brian Cox dancing to call me, maybe. What more could anyone want? Let's get into this week's flop. This album turned 20 on March 17th. Danny Minogue's Neon Nights. It's gained cult status among pop fans, but it didn't quite get the praise it deserved in mine and my guest's opinion at the time of release. Joining me to unpack its legacy is DJ, broadcaster and writer Conor Behan. Conor Behan, it is my absolute pleasure to have you on Flop Culture. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. We've been trying to make this happen for a while, so here we are. I know. we're like here. Her, like our subject, she tried to make it happen for a while and then she got there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Don't leave us in suspense. Who is your subject? Who is your flap? Well, I'm zooming in on a specific era of someone who I think doesn't always get her credit. So I'm, I guess I'm here to give her her flowers in my Miley Cyrus voice. Uh, Danny Minogue, and we're talking about her 2003 album, which is now actually just shy of 20 years old. Like it's 20 years old next month, which freaks me out. And her 2003 album, Neon Nights, which was a kind of a cult favourite like electro pop dance pop album at the time that I went back to for this podcast and was like damn it still really holds up When did you first encounter this record? Because I'm going to be honest I had never ever gone into her back catalogue yeah. prior to doing this podcast like I, I'm ashamed to say my knowledge of her extends to X Factor and probably very annoyingly for her the fact that she's Kylie Minogue's sister Yes, I'm sure she's like, oh, that's great. You only know my sister. Uh, that's a terrible daddy look. What was the, uh, I used to love an X Factor when she'd be like, you were a little bit pitchy tonight, but you were amazing and I'm so glad you're in this competition. Anyway, uh, how do I, so obviously this album came out like a few singles deep. So when she had that kind of moment with Put the Needle on it in like 2002, I was aware of that as like a pop song. Didn't really, I was dimly aware that Danny had had other songs out like she'd had a track in 927 called all i want to do which is like this kind of dance pop song where she's like blonde in the video and there's a goldfish and she's like there's like all these it's a very of its time video lots of internet references it's like gleefully dated now when you watch it um and i remember that song vaguely but i was probably about 10 years old at the time so when put the needle on it came out i was in my like first flushes of being a teenager who was like getting into pop music and like buying CD singles and watching CD UK and all. And weirdly, I didn't really watch Child of the Pops because it was like in our house, my parents wouldn't want to watch Child of the Pops on a Friday night. So actually all those Saturday morning music shows on like UK kids TV. And actually, to be fair, they used to do them on RT a bit as well when they could. Like those are my gateway drugs. And I remember seeing like, here's Danny Minogue and her new song, put the needle on it. And that was kind of, that put it on my radar. And then in 2003, ahead of this album coming out, she dropped a single called I Begin to Wonder, which I think still is an absolute banger. And I was like, wait, what is this? And it prompted me because at the time I would like buy CDs online and I would be like, well, for the price of two or three singles, I can kind of get the album. So I'll just get the album. And that's that's what sent me down the rabbit hole with Danny Minogue at that point. Where was Danny at at this point in her career? Like for anyone who is unfamiliar including me to be honest like what yeah. led her to Neon Nights? So it's interesting because she had been famous in Australia as a kid actually before Kylie was so she was on a TV show called Young Talent Time which she joined in like 83 and she was on it for like five or six years and she joined Young Talent Time at like 11 and so spent basically her like pre-teens into teens being on this it was kind of like an Australian Mickey Mouse Club where kids would perform covers and sketches of like So covers of popular songs and comedy sketches. And it was like a big kind of part of Australian pop culture. Now, I know this now, having done my Danny homework, I wouldn't have known this back when I heard the album first. So that gave her this kind of taste of fame. She left the show in 89, was on Home and Away for a year, which went quite well. And around that time then, she signed a record deal. And that would have been a couple, maybe a few years into Kylie's career, where like obviously she had a sister who was on a soap and doing well, but it wasn't like 
it wasn't like the way Kylie is famous now. So like, I think it probably helped her get the deal, but to be, to her credit in Australia, she would have had a profile of her own. So that led to like a few albums in the early nineties. Like she had a big hit in 93 or four with the cover of the disco song. This is it. She was married to, for, for a little bit, Julie McMahon of Nip Tuck fame. Ooh. So, that, and he's in the video for this is it, which is really funny when you watch it now, you're like, Oh my God, it's the guy charmed. Oh my <laughs> and God. She's like, this is it. And she's like <laughs> jumping in his arms. It's hilarious. So that kind of, that gave her like, you know, she had a decent bit of musical success. She was not like Kylie levels of successful, but like she was holding her own as a pop star. And the music was kind of like, you could hear like the Janet Jackson influences of it, or like the kind of cheesy early nineties dance feel to some of it. And then the album she did in 1997, Girl, the album did okay-ish, but all I want to do, the song we mentioned earlier, that was a big hit for her, particularly in the UK. And I think it kind of gave her the sense that like she should try her hand at dance music a bit more. And so a f- couple of years before Neon Nights, she did vocals on a dance track called Who Do You Love Now, a collab with the, I think, Italian producer called Riva. And it was one of those things where he had this instrumental dance track called Stringer, which was like this dance banger. And the thing to do at the time, and they still do it now, actually, they put a, they wanted to put a vocal over it. So they reached out to her because she'd been doing remixes and club stuff. And that kind of gave people a bit of, Ooh, what is this? This is good. And it kind of helped her shake off maybe the kind of cheesy pop image. And she leaned more into dance music, which kind of, I think it's interesting too, because I'm trying to do the maths here of her age. Like she would have been like late twenties and not early thirties. I'm guessing by the time she did neon nights and that kind of era of dance pop music. And if you remember the early two thousands in like, Obviously, we're not in the UK, but we got a lot of UK pop music. And at the time, boy bands and girl bands were in like a bit of an imperial phase. There was a lot of manufacturer pop going around. Some of the music was great, some of it wasn't, but that was a part of the pop landscape in the UK. And I found it really interesting that like Danny was a bit older than them and it kind of worked in her favor because the music was a bit more like sultry and a bit raunchy. Like the album is quite suggestive and kind of wink, wink. And it's a bit more like, there's something to me kind of iconic about being like, I don't know, 31 or 32. And like, hello, morning television. Here is a s- song about sex with an 80s dance beat. Get into it. Like it was kind of, it stood apart from what some of the teeny boppers were doing. I just, I found, I found she had a different vibe to Kylie. It was slightly like harder musically and even just it was a little bit more almost aggressive compared to Kylie who had just had like, if you think about it, like 2001 can't get in my head is like this like you know career high for Kylie Minogue and she's like back on top of the world but it was there was still a lightness of touch to how Kylie did things and Danny was a bit more like put the needle on it yeah it's about riding you know it was just a bit more raunchy so I think that's kind of where the arc was she was a teeny bopper she'd had you know an interesting bit of success in the 90s and then she found this sweet spot by kind of nodding to the 80s that she grew up in, but also joining it with like nods to electropop and even electroclash, which was a thing kind of emerging out of clubs and, and stuff at the time. Grimy was the word I found myself kind of going towards when listening to this record. And it kind of, that kind of links up with what you're saying about, yeah. you know, that it was this like quite sophisticated pop record, but it was th- this you know, like suggestive, it was fun, but there was like a darkness to it in comparison to Kylie and ev- and, and, and again, and her peers at that time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. For just, sure. And it, and it's funny because there was, there's it happens now and it happened at the time, there was these kind of teen pop stars who were all really keen to like, you know, make their image more sophisticated and adult. So like, Actually, I begin to wonder was held off number one by Beautiful by Christina Aguilera. So, like, that will tell God you the kind damn. of time. God damn what, you, ex I mean, I, I feel like looking at it, I'll be like, you know, I didn't get my first number one, but I was beaten by like what was one of the best ballads of that decade. So, like, fine. About one of the greatest voices of all time. Mm. So, I'm like, I'll take it. But that was kind of when you think of the American pop stars that we were seeing alongside her, and they were often that bit younger than her and really keen to see more grown up and more suggestive. And here was Danny at like, what? I feel bad because I feel like I'm getting, I'm either making her older than she was at the time, but like if she was on Young Talent Time at 11 and 82 in 2003, she would have been 31, right? Like, or 32. Anyway. I trust your maths. It's fine. I'm not a mathematician. I'm a pop music fan. And sometimes those two things don't meet. <laughs> um, but there's something about the idea that like you've got someone in their late 20s, early 30s, being more grown up because they are and you've got like these maybe 22 or 23 year olds being like I too am a grown up and like yeah the first track Creep you know sorry no put the needle on the first track but like it leads into Creep which is the first kind of non-single track you hear and even that has this really hard kind of electric clash kind of feel to it and it's there is a kind of sweaty suggestive feel to it I actually this is a very specific thing to remember I remember reading a few reviews of the album at the time and I was a teenager who like 
kind of was used to reviewers not really being nice about pop albums. And like, there's a whole conversation about poptimism and maybe being too nice about pop albums, but certainly at the time, it was very rare to see a pop album reviewed favorably in any mainstream publication. And I actually think it was RT.E that reviewed it. And they said, they were like, even the album artwork, because the original album artwork is like this shot of her kind of putting her shoe on. It's like a Polaroid. They're like, it's styled like a porn shoot from the eighties. I was like, Oh my God, this woman is being like, she's just going for it. <laughs> she's like, yeah, I just putting the shoe on after a night on the rise. I've been riding people. It was like, you know, and it really wasn't that raunchy, but I just loved that. That was kind of the aura of it. It was faintly, I say sleazy in a good way. I think it kind of cut through. And it's probably why, I mean, I was a teenager at the time, so I can't speak to what it was doing in the clubs because I wouldn't have known. But like, I get the vibe that it went down well with kind of gays and the queer audience because it had a bit more oomph and a bit more wink-wink to it than maybe other pop would have had at the time. I can't believe that conversation around the cover because it is just like, she's even talked about it since she did an interview with the official chair company in the UK for the 15th anniversary when they released the vinyl and stuff. And she was kind of talking through, and I think they released it with a different cover, but she was talking through like the process of shooting it and not being funny. It's just like pictures of her kind of like laying around the place. But even the way she talks about it is like, yeah, we had some shots that were like really, you know, like casual and like uh, spur of the moment, (laughs) like spontaneous. And then others that were like really set up. I was like, but like... Come on now, like, it's just a picture of you. And I love it. I think it looks, I think it works so well with the vibe of the record. But to hear people talk about it and compare it to, like, a porn shoot, like, really, really, Yeah, like, I think what it had was, like, and I'm sure there's people, I'm sure when they shot it, there was, like, fashion photographers that were referencing, but it did have that feel of, like, just slightly, like, in a way, a more elevated, but also this kind of kicked back, like, oh, if we did this in the 80s, the glamour would be this and it wouldn't be as thought out. Whereas she, her contemporaries were often very polished pop stars where I'm sure labels were pouring tons of money into like making them look a certain way. Like she was on the same label as acts like Holly Valance, who's obviously a very polished and kind of perfect pop star in comparison. I don't know. I, it, it's it's an interesting uh, the kind of body work. Because obviously, look, it's not a fully perfect album. There's a few songs where I'm like, this feels like filler, but like it has a sense of tone and an identity to it where you can kind of tell she drove the ship because there's a ton of really great songwriters and some like people like Karen Poole and Corby and Black Cell who did a lot of that kind of pop in the early 2000s and I, they don't seem to do as much now but like some artists like Karen Poole and Hannah Robinson who were really big at the time and still work a lot with, you know in the pop songwriting world and then even one of the funniest things to me is there's a song on the album called Vibe On which is basically an ode to her vibrator and one of the writers on it is a guy called Savan Kotecha who's now gone on to write for Ellie Goulding, The Weeknd, One Direction. Like he's written on some of the biggest pop songs of the last 10 years. And like one of his first credits is a Danny Minogue song about your vibrator. <laughs> like how iconic. Like I'm like, she really got like, you know, the best of that kind of Swedish pop production. And she threw in people she works with, like Ian Masterson, you know, like she really, you get the sense, because even with the B sides and the like the remix and stuff, it just all kind of made sense as a project. And oddly, when I think of a pop album, in recent years with a similar kind of unified feel, I would argue that Dua Lipa's Future Nostalgia has a similar kind of vibe. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah, you know, and even It just has that sense of like, all the artwork and the imaging is pretty consistent. When we do these extra songs, it's still going to like, they're obviously different albums in a way, but like it, it reminds you of Future Nostalgia in that like it has its kind of own musical identity. And it's also like, it's pop and it would have fit in with the landscape, but it also has a, lot, a little bit of enough to stand out as well. And there's a throwback element of, it's very much an eight, an eighties love letter. In a way, I don't think a teeny bop or pop star beside her would have been able to do because they wouldn't have literally grown up with that music the way she did. Like if you think about it, money making this connection now, she would have performed some of the biggest songs of the eighties on Australian television as a kid. So like it was probably in her bones to be like, let's reference eighties Madonna with this, like because she sung it on television. You know, that's what I was going to say. It's not her wearing it as a costume. Like it's her through yeah. and through. Like it feels very authentic like it feels I don't really know what I was expecting from the album but like I was pleasantly surprised and at no point was I was like at no point was I like this is weird this doesn't seem like this no no part of it felt jarring to me at all side note uh, if anyone writes a pop song about wanking I automatically like it that's just like if you ever need like material to mine from just (laughs) all the good songs they're always about wanking honestly it's hard to fail I mean and it's funny to think too like you know mentioning say like Madonna and then she did actually sample into the groove for a remix of Don't Wanna Lose This Feeling like and I remember that was 
So Don't Want to Lose This Feeling was a song on the album and they did like a single remix of it, which happened, like it still happens now a bit, but it was a big thing at the time because like if you were on single three or four, A, you might want to polish a song up for radio, which is a standard thing for pop songs, but also it made people want to maybe go out and buy the single to get the new version. And they also added as a B-side a mashup of Don't Want to Lose This Feeling with Into the Groove and the original like album version of Into Groove, like the one people knew from back in the day. And I remember Danny being like, we never thought we would get the sample cleared. We were shocked. Like apparently Madonna heard it and liked it. And at the time, I mean, you still, there's been a few Madonna samples and nods in recent years and kind of in the TikTok era. But at the time that was unheard of for someone to actually clear a Madonna sample. And it was kind of like a little, I think, seal of approval that I'm sure Danny was thrilled to get. Because people still kind of wrote her off or said, oh, you're just, you know, a cheap copy of her sister. Because like vocally they do sound similar, but like... Mm they actually do end up doing different things, particularly in this album where she kind of, he compared it to Fever by Kylie, which came out two years previous and taking even the sister vibe out of it. They are kind of doing similar things musically in terms of their electro pop albums, but like Fever is lighter and airier and kind of nods to house music. Whereas this album is a bit more down and dirty and it's very A's and it's very like campy and wink wink. So I would imagine the Madonna thing probably for her was like the ultimate seal of approval. Just completely deciding what was going through Danny's head here. Don't mind me. No, but I like, how could it not be, as you said, when she hadn't cleared stuff before? And I think, again, she'd referenced that thing of, in the official charts interview, where she was just like, we never thought we'd get it. And then we did. And it was like, gas. I, and I when I heard when I heard that song, listening to the album for this, I thought my brain was going to explode. Like, just what? I was like, What? So and like good. Mash, mashups and stuff were big, were having a bit of a moment around that time. So I, I could see how it would have existed as a bootleg, but to get the official approval of it when it was such a legal nightmare at the time is amazing. And obviously like Madonna is very, even now you still wouldn't see her on a lot of compilations or on things that like, like she's just not an artist's music ends up out in the world without her like explicit approval. And it, there's funny because other mashups, I think one of them is on the deluxe edition, the, I begin to wonder a mashed with them, dead or alive, so mm. you spin me around. And it's so good. Like they were just really well put together. And like, I'm going to be really shady here. You see a lot of mashups now on TikTok and YouTube, et cetera. And I'm like, a lot of these are really fucking bad. They're not well produced. The songs don't go together. Like these mashups she was doing, I'm like, they're a masterclass in how to combine samples and pop songs. Like I'm like, some of you little TikTok DJs, to go back to the Danny Minogue album and you could learn a thing or two. Some of the liberties that the TikTok DJs take, because I'm going to be shady as well, like, it kills me. I'm like, I cannot believe you uploaded this video and it's like, they're not even in the same key. And That's they're what like, kills and me. they're like, oh what, my God. look at this sick mashup and it's my, like, it's, it, it you know, kills and it, they, me. They love to just get ABBA and put it with something. I'm like, ABBA doesn't go with everything. That's why you have to have a fucking ear anyway. And if you're going to do mashups, bring Danny Minogue into the conversation. Yeah, Let's get Danny trending, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get Danny trending. Don't, I don't know if you can get something trending on TikTok because I don't use it, but like that, you know, marketing people love to say that. Let's get that trending. I'm Let's like, get it viral. Mm. How many hits like, can we get, guys? You think we can make this viral? I'm like, absolutely. You know, now they've asked, we can't. But yeah, I think... It's funny because like I did buy CD singles at the time and albums, but I didn't always buy both because like sometimes it didn't feel necessary. But with Danny, I remember I had a CD single. I've put the needle on it that had these amazing remixes, which I think actually most of them are on the deluxe edition. And then I bought that single with Don't Want to Lose This Groove because I wanted that mashup thing. But there was a great piece I called Goodbye Song, which is now on the Goodbye deluxe. Song. It's is, so good. It's probably my favorite on the album. And yeah, it's like, like a B-side. It's so, because uh, to be honest, you look at a title and you're like, I don't know. I was like, this is her ballad. ballad. This is her yeah. ballad. Because it goes into, the track list on Spotify goes into an acoustic track. So I was like, okay, mm-hmm. whatever. And then I put it on Stomper. Absolute yeah. Stomper. Just basically a bit, a fuck you to this guy she's with and just being like, great, I'm, yeah. like, I am no longer obsessing over you anymore. Like this is done. I do not care. Erase from my memory. So it's, good. Actually, that would be a great single for someone now. And it's just the reason I, and actually, so if you're, if you, anyone's listening wants to stream it, there's the version of the album that's on streaming is basically the regular album and they've added in like B-sides and hidden tracks. They've kind of, any bit of music that was released officially, they've put into one package, which sometimes I find a bit clunky. And there's a lot of long remixes, which you could maybe even skip just to get a feel for the album. Mm. But it means that a lot of the like, B-side-y stuff that was actually because to be honest pop B-side sometimes they're great sometimes they're not like it's a hit and miss with her I feel like they had a very strong pool of these are songs in the same vein and we're all we're going to make them work together so even the kind of off cuts from the album end up being 
really strong. You're like, damn, like some of these could have been singles and they're better than the actual singles. So if you're listening to it now, I'm kind of glad you can get the full effect because, you know, a lot of big pop stars are re-digitizing their back catalog or they're like going, hey, this single from 2002 is now in line with all those remixes because I think they're realizing a lot of stuff we made is going to get lost if we don't kind of place it somewhere online. Absolutely. Um, Four singles from the album, we've mentioned a lot of them. Who Do You Love Now was the first. Put the needle on it second. I Begin to Wonder third. What a tune. We'll come back to it. Don't want to lose this feeling. Is there any other song from that pool, I suppose, that you would have released as a fifth single? Oh, yes. What would I have, I'm actually just going to look at the track listing here as we talk. I mean, it is, a, that deluxe edition on Spotify is a monster. All albums should be. We need to go back to two hour, 30 minute albums. I'm sick of yeah. it. I'm sick of the 90 second song. Like movies I should know. be shorter. Songs should be Those longer. Should be longer. That's, <laughs> yes. What would I, what would I, oh God, that's a good question. I mean, I think they did a great job of picking the best songs as singles. I think Hey, So What is a really fun song and it's produced by Jules and Stone to do the lowest of like S Club and stuff back in the day. They're great pop producers. So probably that, I think she performed Mystified on TV once or twice. I feel like maybe that was in the running, but the run of singles they chose are great. I mean, if you're going to include B-sides, I think like you fully could have made Goodbye Song a single, but like, I think that's the thing too. Sometimes you get these great pop albums where like they just pick the weirdest singles. But with that album, I feel like they took the best it took what works the best to give you a feel for what the album was like. And there were still kind of hidden gems then when you hopefully listen to the full album. What's your favorite song on the album? Oh my God. I mean, I think as obvious as it sounds, it's probably I Begin to Wonder because to me, that's just like a really great 2000s pop song, full stop or period, as they would say in America. Uh, period. I'm <laughs> just laughing at someone listening to Danny Brown going, period. <laughs> that's maybe how we make Danny go viral um probably I begin to wonder if we're talking like big banging singles but uh, I mean if I'm taking the album into account it's it's probably I begin to wonder and put the needle on it like if we're talking faves because I will still play those in isolation but it's an album I love to put on straight through because I know it's going to have like this kind of specific feel and it's up tempo and it's it's well crafted and fun I also love I Begin to Wonder. It's it's so funny when you come to an album like this and because, you know, obviously flap culture is all about kind of like underrated stuff or whatever. And yeah. like, and again, because I had never heard this even amongst my groups of group of friends. So when I went and listened to this and I was like, oh my God, I cannot believe For the Record isn't the biggest song in the world. What the hell? And then you look at Spotify and it's like, oh yeah, don't, yeah. It, it has 7 million streams. Like for, this isn't like you being like, yeah. we, we need to get it out there to the people. It's like <laughs> people knew, babe. People knew. Yeah. I love that song. I love For the Record as well, because again, it has that like wink, wink. She's like looking at you over the shoulder like you mm-hmm. know like teasing she sounds really good on it um, and I I can't say I can't say enough good things about Goodbye Song I've already said it but yeah I they're know. probably my three faves and like the first Goodbye Song she's like kind of talking there's a bit where she goes she goes I think I have a and then a robot voice goes a minute and twenty twenty nine, implying that like even if he came over for the ride he wouldn't last long I'm like okay you really didn't <laughs> hold back here you know and that's probably a nod to like I think that's where the sexy parts of the album are fun is that they feel like a nod to like Vanity Six and the girl groups that would work to Prince and that kind of like those like disco and fun kids that would pop through in the 80s that were, you know, in the 70s and 80s that were like suggestive and kind of a bit more bald and a bit more like wink, wink than maybe the kind of raunch that was mainstream in the 2000s. Raunch is such a smash hits kind of word. I'm like, it, that's a word you would have seen in smash hits back in the day. But yeah, it's just, yeah, it's, it's definitely an album that has a proper nod to the past in it, but it feels very of its time in a good way. Like she wasn't making a pastiche, but she was bringing a lot of, I'm sure like references she really liked to the four. Do you think it's dated at all in any way? Um, A teeny bit like, you know, the style of dance music she was embracing is very much of its time. But then it's funny because sometimes people say, oh, something is time is because it sounds like you could put it out today. And I'm like, I understand that. But I think too, sometimes I think it's good if you make something that represents the era, because if you're plugged into what was big at the time, you can then turn back and go, this is what it kind of sounded like. So yeah, probably some of it is probably a little bit of its time, but I don't think that's a bad thing. And then a lot of it still sounds good because it's like, she was playing with kind of the building blocks of dance pop anyway, and those haven't really gone away. And they always, whether it's, you know, 
people like Joel Corey or like, I don't know, like Jack Jones making these kind of dance bangers that are like pop songs just released via a DJ to like maybe someone like Lady Gaga or to a leaper embracing retro sounds in some way. Like these kind of things in dance and pop kind of always circle each other in some way all the time. And so I think a lot of what she did on this has stood the test of time and it's very ultra specific. And the funny thing is, is like, she released, you know, she's released singles and dancings after this album, but this is the last kind of full album we've gotten from her. So it's an interesting mission statement in terms of in terms of I gave you a full body of work. So like and it worked and like you can go back to it whenever you want and it's always going to be there because since then it's been kind of one offs and remixes and bits and bobs. Yeah, so what happened after Neon Nights? Like, it did it did okay in terms of charting. Yeah. It went to, like, number eight in the UK, went to 25 in Australia. It's certified gold in the UK. When it was uh, released on vinyl, it charted really well on the vinyl chart in the UK. Um, but this was kind of, even in the conversations and from what I was reading about this album, because the album previous hadn't done as well as they thought, it seemed to be this conversation towards her that it was like, this is your last and like best chance at doing something. So was this like, there was, there was nothing else really after this. I think it did do well as a project because ultimately she had proper, like she had a rake of top 10 singles out of it. And one of her biggest, the biggest single of her career effectively, if not the big, if not one of the biggest, I begin to wonder. So like, I think it, when you look, I'm sure if you looked back at it as a whole, you go, this did really well. How well the album did, I guess, is kind of up for debate, but it was kind of a hard sell with pop albums back then as well. I think, ironically, even though sales are different now, I think pop albums can actually do better in the streaming era than they they did in the sales era, I would argue. But it did well. I think what happened after was she she kind of embraced a new record deal with a, a label called All Around the World, which were known for doing a lot of dance stuff at the time. And it led to these really strong kind of like one-off singles and interesting things. She did a song called So Under Pressure, that was meant to be kind of about her reaction to Kylie's cancer diagnosis and how that put the family in this kind of like position of worry and anxiety. And like, I thought that was kind of a, quite an avant-garde, not, not avant-garde in like a Bjork sense, but for like a dance pop artist, it had a kind of odd left to center vibe while being a dance song. So she released tracks like that. And, you know, she did a song called You Won't Forget About Me, which was one of those, they found an instrumental that was big in the clubs and she wrote a song over it. She did a track called Perfection that took like, a sample of turn the beat around and turn it into a dance track that she then wrote a vocal on. Like she had kind of these one-off dance songs that did decently, but there was, I think the momentum of another album seemed to elude her. And there was a greatest hits album a few years later called the hits and beyond, which was basically like a compilation of singles, obviously. And then the beyond section was a handful of new songs that built on what Neon Knights did and really worked brilliantly. There's a song on there called love fight, which is like, I think one of the great lost pop songs that if someone had released it properly would have been huge. It's like this ridiculous over the top, like eighties kind of club song. It's really cleverly done. So like, I think she was probably, I'd need to like go back and do my Danny homework in the interviews. I got the vibe. They were building up to a second album in a similar vein and maybe it was hard to fully release it or get it out there. There's like a compilation album that she dropped a little bit after that's got remixes and a few random tracks on it. And then there's a lot of re-releases of old material that happened as well. So like post Neon Nights, there ended up being quite a bit of Danny music. It just wasn't released in the usual single, single, here's an album kind of way. So I think it started to maybe lose some of the general public, but I think maybe fans of hers were thrilled because it was a kind of drip feed of stuff for a while. And then when she started going into telly, I think, I don't want to say the music dried up because that sounds harsh, but I just mean, I think her time to actually focus on music got taken away by the fact that she was on like Australian reality TV that then led to XRT UK, which was part of for a number of years. And obviously that show, when she joined, she joined when that show was big and then only got bigger. And I think she was part of the show for like a very tumultuous period, which I'm sure made her a lot of money and ra- massively raised her profile but I would say took up a lot of your year and your kind of life, basically. The priority might have not necessarily been there for the music when you are working on the show that, as you mentioned, like we did, there's an earlier episode this season where we talked about uh, Ridian coming second on The X Factor and like yeah. Danny was his mentor and I'm oh, yeah, 99% yeah, yeah. sure that was her first year doing it. And so that mm-hmm. was that was the third season. So like massive but like only only getting bigger like only really starting that climb yeah. of just being the biggest show on TV event television you have to be there who are you voting yeah. for like it just it's hard to fathom how big it 
it, like it's it seems like a distant memory now, but at the time it was just it was such a thing, and she did become this household name again, but for a thing that wasn't like when I watched X Factor at that age, like I was I was like, oh, she's Kylie Minogue's sister, oh yeah, but like I didn't know anything that came before it. I wouldn't yeah. have known the success of Neon Nights at all, like. And it's funny because she started on X Factor in the UK in 2007 and she did Australia's Got Talent that same year. And I think doing the Australian version was what led to doing the show and doing X Factor in the UK because obviously they're owned by the company. The, all the, the rights and the shows are owned by the same people. And so they're all kind of watching the foreign editions and going, oh, well, actually that person's known here. We should throw them on. And I remember like people go, oh, why is Danny there? What does she know? Like blah, blah, blah. And I'm kind of like, I get it. She's not like the world's biggest pop star. But actually, if you put down the hater shades for like all of a second, she had, she's had a bunch of albums. She's been in the entertainment business since she was 11 years old. And she's known what it's like to be famous and do talent shows and then have your own career for like, at that point, over like what, 20 years? It's like, she is qualified. And then also the fact that like, you obviously want judges on shows like that to be in some way qualified to speak to the talent but also you need them to be good telly. And she was, she was glamorous and funny, entertaining. And she did have like a maternal side that I think emerged as she stayed on longer. Cause initially she was kind of pitted against Sharon. There was an implication that like Simon fancy Danny and she's only there as a bit of arm candy. And then that get got turned on Danny when Cheryl joined. And the implication was that Danny was like this stuffy older lady and Cheryl was there. And I was like, no, like actually they're both pop stars who know what they're talking about. Like they know how to help talent. And also it's a TV show and they're good television. Do you know? And I'm not trying to say the X Factor was a serious documentary, but like they didn't just, I mean, I think the problem with that show was down the line. They did start plucking people who weren't as connected, mm-hmm. but actually they had a reason to be there. And I think there's a reason Danny has done so much telly, particularly in Australia since like she has done, she's one of the judges on mass in Australia, which is huge over there. Like she came back to do let it shine in the UK, I think in like 2016. And she's actually doing a gay dating show for BBC three that I think is out this year, but like when you look at Danny's telly CV, the last 10, 15 years, she has been, and up the walls and she got fashion line with Target in Australia like Target's huge do you know what I mean like she's worked a lot and I built a very interesting career it just doesn't fit the kind of because when we talk about flops in pop music we kind of I think anybody anything outside of someone having six number ones and eight best-selling albums you go they're a flop and it's like actually to make it as a pop star is very difficult and the career she's maintained and the level of fame she's maintained is actually unusual mm. for someone to maintain even if you're not into the music or don't even know that she did music so it's interesting to look at it out and go damn this person's worked and worked and worked completely how I'm, I want to phrase this like correctly but like how much do you think like being Kylie's sister affected the career trajectory as well obviously that's not like Kylie's fault or Kylie's responsibility but you can't help yeah. but think uh, you, you mentioned the people with the hater shades on they're the people who are like she is just Kylie's sister like she's living in Kylie's shadow she's doing like you know what I mean she'll never be Kylie and then there's the question yeah. of like did Danny ever want to be Kylie obviously yeah. she was musical as well like of course she was going to pursue this career you know like it's it's a tricky one I mean, I suppose, because obviously in an odd way, this plays into the kind of conversation about Nepo babies and nepotism that's never gone away, but has had a, obviously a hot streak of late in pop culture and on TikTok, etc. Like, I'm sure when she was looking for a record deal, the fact that her sister was emerging as this like massive star in Australian pop music and breaking internationally was probably like a huge like win for whoever wanted to sign her. But like, there also then comes that kind of, because it's one thing when your mom or dad or family are wealthy and give you the connections to launch your own career because they might go, well, I still have to work hard, but you can argue, well, all we've ever known is this and you've got the connections. Whereas when your parents are not pop stars and a sibling is one, it's like, does that kind of advantage go sideways as opposed to trickling down? I don't actually know. Oh, like, I don't think it does. I was no, going to say this. the same way. I don't know if you listen to Who Weekly, but Lindsay Weber always says this, like that it's, I don't think the nepotism... To like to sibling, I don't think it, it does not transfer in the way that it does no. like parent to child. I'm sure there are some ex- exceptions, but even if you're yeah. to look at like the Hemsworths, the Hemsworths are like enemy number one on this podcast for some reason. But anyway, like you know, <laughs> and they're like, Australian, so and it's all in the family. And they're Aussie. I don't you're know why. Right. It's me, Danny. You right. <laughs> but the other Hemsworth that was in Westworld and kind of not much, Luke. 
Poor Luke, sorry. Oh my God, the other Hemsworth. The other, there's like, there's a third Wilson brother as well who isn't Luke or Owen and ex- like he, exactly. he gets that as well. You know yeah. what I mean? It's just, I don't think the, the, anyway, that was all to say that I agree with you. Like, I don't think it transfers in that same way at all. And I think it's actually like much, much harder. Not in a way that I'm like sympathetic. Like, obviously, Danny's clearly fine. You know what I mean? She's fine. Yeah, She's of made a mint, has loads of work, whatever. But... I can imagine the frustration on her end where it's just, I'm, I'm trying to do something like kind of different to what Kylie's doing. We mentioned like the darkness and the grunginess and the griminess and stuff and still maybe not be taken as seriously or just be fobbed off as like, well, you're just Kylie's sister and you're you're not even like to, to anywhere near the same standard as her. I think the problem really is that well, to be fair, if you listen to some of the early Danny stuff, it did sound different to what Kylie was doing. And I think that's to her credit that Danny was that bit younger and said like, and I, I remember her saying for her first, I remember her first album or second album, I'm not as up on the early stuff because Neon Nights was my entry point, but like she went to New York and worked with these producers and they had no idea who she was or really her sister because Kylie hadn't really, I think the locomotion had done well in America, but they weren't thinking of her in those terms and that she made the album as just this up and coming pop star and she really put her all into it. And initially they did sound different musically. The thing really, I think that was probably tricky is their voices are not identical, but they do sound similar. And so it would be easy to mix them up if you heard them in passing on the radio or something like that's probably where it may have been, I think, tricky because they just sound similar voices. But like, I suppose the thing is, when Danny leaned into dance music, that was probably tricky because Kylie had flirted with that at different stages of her career as well. And particularly around Neon Nights, like I think Neon Nights probably got compared harshly to something like Fever, not because they're not both good albums. It's just because Fever was this huge moment for Kylie, like everywhere. Like that album put her back in the US in a way she hadn't been in like a good 20 years at that point or 15 years. So like, I think... I would say it probably did hinder Danny at times and it was an unfair association. Like even I have mentioned Kylie a number of times in this conversation, bringing up the Danny album. And that's partly because I love Neon Nights, but it's part of an era where that kind of electro pop was in the ether because of people like Kylie. So it probably hasn't helped. But then also I think looking at it now, I kind of think it's, I would imagine it's worked out quite well in that both of them are still in the public eye and successful in their own unique ways. Like the work Danny's done in tell you, like Kylie's done, you know, the voice UK and stuff, but like has never really, as she probably hasn't needed to, but ha- or maybe hasn't wanted to. She's not done telly stuff the same way. And you've got this thing now where like Kylie can do, like, I don't know if you've ever seen the videos of Kylie's Christmas concert a few years ago. And they did, her and Danny have a Christmas song together called hundred degrees. It's like a disco song. It's great. They actually did a non Christmas version of it too, which is handy if you want to have it on your playlist in like March. Um, but they brought Danny out as a surprise guest to sing it with her at that show. And no one knew that she was doing that. And apparently, I think there was like maybe some of Kylie's family there as well. Well, Kylie and Danny's family, obviously. But like when you watch that footage, the roar and love from that crowd of like Kylie slash Danny fans for Danny, who doesn't really tour or perform live the same amount. I was like, that's kind of amazing that they can come out and there's no beef. And they're, and they're, and they're two sisters who've had pop careers and they can have this moment. And like, they did a performance of that song on X Factor Australia together and they're in these like Bob Mackie style dresses like, and it's a nod to Sharon Tina Turner. Like, I think now, given that their careers have kind of gone in slightly different directions within entertainment, it's actually kind of cool because it's like, they have a shared experience and ways in which they sometimes cross over, but then they've also gotten to do their own things. And I suppose it shows you what it's like to try and make your way in a field where a sibling is doing the same thing. Like, even if you were in, I don't know, accounting and your sister's the biggest accountant in Dublin <laughs> and do you want to be one too I don't know <laughs> you can tell I've never had a normal job <laughs> I'm trying to relate this you know if you if you're a builder and your brother's a builder but like I just think now when you look back it's actually kind of cool because at times they were running parallel and then times their lives went in different directions but they seem to be like I know there was rumors back in the day that I didn't get on which I never really believed because I'm like the press would love us to believe that but like you see kind of photos them together now or them doing things and you're like nah like that's kind of fucking cool that you know they're both pop stars and celebs and they can share the experience they have I think one other brother I don't know how big their family is and they have at least one other sibling who isn't famous and their parents aren't from the entertainment world so it's like probably nice to be able to text your sister and be like come here like I have to perform on this show can you imagine and they're like oh my god do you have to sing live like do you know what I mean like having that shared experience so I'm sure it probably hindered her to career or like not hindered her career but I'm sure it was something she had to factor in in terms of the reaction and the treatment she got. But I also think 
in the grand scheme of things, it must be kind of cool. I mean, listen, maybe Danny would come on and go, no, it was it's a pain in the arse. But like, I, I like to think now it's kind of an advantage, you know. It's so funny how much like the more things change, the more they stay the same. Like the press, yeah. the press hate women and they hate yeah. women who get on with their families. You know what I mean? They're just yeah, like, give us yeah, a row, forbid, otherwise we don't forbid. care. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, but there's nothing here for us. Otherwise we don't want a nice relationship between you. You must hate yeah. each other, surely. Um, Connor, it's been a pleasure. I would yes, love. Thank you for having me. I would love your. You've you've given such a good elevator pitch already, but I suppose for anyone <laughs> who's maybe they're at the end of this episode and they're like, maybe I'm going to check this Danny girl yeah. out. Maybe I'm going to check yeah. this album out. What is your elevator pitch for Neon Nights? If you want a pop album that is consistent and fun to listen to and has like a nod to the eighties, but kind of has like the 2000s dance music energy, this is the perfect thing you can put on. Like even that deluxe edition, the first. 19 first 20 songs are all up tempo there's one acoustic ballad and then there's some actually really good remixes if you're a dance music girly so like give the album a go i honestly think you'd be pleasantly surprised i think there's either people who just as you say like yourself had never just heard her music or maybe assume that her music isn't good because they only know her from the telly and it's like if you're ever going to try a danny minogue's music just jump in because it starts to put the needle on it which is one of her best singles ever and by track three you're on to i begin to wonder so either way you're hearing two of her like kind of signature tracks and then you can decide how you feel about the rest of it I love it I love it so much where can people <laughs> find out more from you read yes. the stuff you write read the things you talk about listen <laughs> to you where can people find you uh, so on social media it's Connor Bean on Instagram and Twitter I try and talk about pop culture and books and all that stuff on my Instagram stories when I can I've yet to do reels which is Instagram is really keen for me to do by all the messaging I get every day on the app and there is a podcast I host called Housewives of Me if you're into Real Housewives it is chats with people like Fanula about their journey with the show it is on a break I don't know when it's back don't ask me when it's back because I don't know but there's 85 episodes there if you listen to so you've got some homework to do I cover shows on 2 found Entertainment News and over the weekends as well so you might hear me there and if you're ever in Dublin and you want to dance and maybe I'll squeeze Danny in I DJ in the George Thursdays and Saturday nights as well but ask nicely don't be a feral weirdo I don't know what yeah. COVID's ruined some of your dance for etiquette and oh just... my that's a whole nother podcast and like Danny I begin to wonder <laughs> brackets if everyone is okay because I think a lot of them aren't <laughs> I don't think they are Connor I don't <laughs> Connor thank you so thank much you. for joining me on Flap Culture thank you Big thanks to Connor again for joining me. You can listen to Connor every Sunday on the request show at 6 pm on RT2 FM. Neon Nights is being reissued for its 20th anniversary, so keep an eye on Danny's page for more info on that. Uh, and Connor actually reminded me after we recorded uh, that Queen Danny actually played Mitchellstown once upon a time, and her performance gave birth to this iconic headline from the Irish Times Danny, comma, boys, comma, the pipes are calling. Uh, and this paragraph as well, I enjoyed. The headlining act at the Mitchellstown Guinness Music Festival is likely to attract thousands, including, quote, a lot of men or older boys who'd be very interested in Miss Minogue, said one of the organisers, Carol Duggan, a primary school teacher. So there you go. There you go. And I'd love to know where those men or older boys are now. And uh, if they want to get in touch, it's helloflopculture at gmail.com. Same to you, Carl Duggan, if you're listening. What was the gig like? Were you there? Let me know. I'd be very interested here. Lastly, let's decide who is Top of the Flops this week. You're a flop. Honourable mentions to the US fiscal system and whatever Credit Suisse is. I, I'm i like the mam from Arrested Development when it's like, go see a Star Wars. I don't know anything about that. But anyway, uh, top of the flops this week is Diplo. Uh, so last week, this is probably kind of old news, but I feel like it's worth just rehashing and talking about. Last week he was on uh, Emrata's podcast, The High Low, uh, in which he talked about a lot of things, like their friends, but I suppose the soundbite that's been picked up the most is kind of around his sexuality. There was one uh, quote uh, in which he said he'd probably received a blowjob from a man before adding, I don't know if it's gay unless you make eye contact, right? And I know his whole thing is trying to be funny and I get that it's kind of tongue-in-cheek and he's had like good or like better quotes than this before around, you know, kind of not really buying into the construct of sexuality and he's described masculinity as like a prison before which are all generally like good good things to say 
from someone of his stature, of his status. But like, there's a reason Emrata took this clip down off social media. You know what I mean? There's a reason why you can't comment on this anywhere. And I just think it's because it was kind of a stupid thing to say, in my opinion. Like, I just think, I get, I vaguely get where he was going with this, but I think even in doing it in the jokey, inverted commas, kind of way, is inherently, like, unhelpful. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of these sentences where I'm just like, you probably could have stopped there. You know what I mean? Like, okay, you can't remember if you got a blowjob from a man. That's fine. I can't remember what I did yesterday. Time is relentless. You, I Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, Diplo's doing things from one end of the day to the other. He can't remember. That's grand. It all just feels like a mouth. Grand. Whatever. Does he need to say, I don't know if it's gay unless you make eye contact, even as a joke? I don't think so. It's just a bit, it's a bit embarrassing. It's a bit embarrassing, in my opinion. And the, do you know what? The thing that tipped me over the edge and the reason why I've brought him forward a week is that I was on Instagram there and I saw a video of him having made... And I don't I don't think he's selling this as merch, right? And if he is, ultimate flop behaviour, right? But he did get a t-shirt made or someone got a t-shirt made for him that said, not, not gay. And I'm just like... I don't know. Girls, something about it doesn't sit right with me. Doesn't, doesn't sit right with me. You know what I mean? There's a part of me that still thinks a part, he won't say it like outrightly or won't even just be like, I think Lucas Gage has said it before about in in interviews where, and it's kind of become a joke because it's kind of funny, but he's talked about how, you know, nobody knows his alphabet, i.e. within the realms of the LGBTQ plusness, etc. Which I think is a more powerful statement than whatever Diplo's trying to say here. You know what I mean? There's still a part of me that thinks a lot of what he's saying is like wrapped in shame. And I wonder, is that a concern about alienating fan bases? I don't know. Doesn't sit right with me, as I said. And the t-shirt was the final straw for me. So Diplo, top the flops. Top of them flops. I don't care if he did, he did a marathon recently and I don't care about that either. Says she and she's doing a triathlon, but anyway. Thank you so much for listening once again to Flop Culture. Please rate the show five stars on Apple Podcasts and you will get a personalised bop or flop recommendation from me. Uh, Something to watch, something to listen to, something to, I don't know, just get your mind a moving that I think you will enjoy because I really enjoy it. All you have to do is leave your nickname on the review. I'll see it. You'll get it read out at the end of each episode. And then I will recommend something to you and you can go forth and enjoy it, hopefully. You can also leave a five-star review on Spotify. It helps people find the show. It's hugely appreciated by me. This podcast has been edited, as always, by Adam Shannon. Artwork by Brian Lambert. Until next time, bye-bye. Bye-bye.